Hi everyone and welcome to MST Global's Tech Talk series. I'm Elizabeth Fabry, your host. Uh, today we're speaking with MST Global's General Manager, Product Management and Marketing, Mark Palmer, who is highly experienced across uh, engineering sales, product management and marketing. So we know you're very busy, Mark. So thanks so much for joining us today. You're welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me. Uh, so today we'll be discussing MST Global's uh, proximity detection system, which not only plays a crucial role in enhancing safety for underground mines, but also uh, surface operations such as ports, um, industrial and construction sites, where there is a risk of collision between um, personnel, vehicles and equipment. Um, so to kickstart our discussion, Mark, can you provide an introduction into MST Global's proximity detection system, the components that make this up and how they all work together to improve safety? Yeah, sure. So essentially the system is designed um, to keep uh, people um, and equipment safe that work around other bits of moving equipment. Um, so it's very much um, around making sure uh, that the inevitable interaction between people and machines is kept as safe as possible. So that's essentially what the system does. Um, it's got a few components. Um, the first one would be uh, the tag that a person would wear. Um, that could be um, a tag or in a cap lamp, or it may be a vehicle tag, something that would identify the person or the, or the thing to be detected. Um, there's a display for the operator. Um, there's a system control unit and um, a low frequency um, exciter produce a magnetic field and that's quite an important part of the thing. In terms of how they work together, I suppose starting from the inside out, the operator display um, is a key part. This is designed specifically to not distract the operator and it's designed specifically to allow them to make quick decisions based on what's going on around them. Um, the tags are, um, we call them haptic devices, so they, they alert people to danger by ha flashing. Is that haptic? Sort of flashing. Haptic device. A haptic, yes. Yeah. A haptic device. Um, so essentially, it uh, has three ways of communicating. It has a flashing light, um, it vibrates, and it has a beep. Um, so that should overcome all of those distractions in the workplace. Um, the exciters, I suppose, is one of the things that gives us a, is a unique use of the technology. And so the exciter um, creates a low frequency magnetic field, um, a, a sort of a bubble, if you like, around the vehicle. And, and this, is the, this is the technique that we use to detect uh, the people or equipment in this area. And then tying it all together, we've got the system controller, which is really the kind of the smarts. Um, ties those bits together, but also interfaces with the vehicle as well. And you mentioned the system relies on these magnetic fields for detection. Why is this more powerful than Wi-Fi or GPS? Well, that's a good question. I suppose the fundamental thing is that um, this device, this system needs to work both below ground and above ground. Okay, so they're, they're very different environments. The magnetic field creates um, a sort of a bubble around the vehicle. Um, it's a 360 degree sort of coverage. Um, and the thing with it is that once you've created the bubble around the vehicle, as the vehicle moves, the bubble moves with it. So essentially that protection zone is always in place around the vehicle. Okay, so it's not relying on infrastructure around it. If you look at the specific technologies you mentioned, Wi-Fi is something that MST uses for tracking purposes for sure. Um, and we know a lot about it, but Wi-Fi in itself is not a great technology for detecting uh, distances. Um, and it also can rely on infrastructure. And so although it's, um, it's a good technology on its own, it's not capable of detecting distances. And of course, with GPS, although it gives you highly accurate positioning, you need line of sight to the sky. And so if we'd gone down the path of GPS, this would be a surface only system. Um, and we need something which is capable of operating uh, in both environments. And the system has several detection zones. Um, so the warning zone, the danger zone, and the safe zone. Can you take us through, through those in further detail and how they can be tailored to meet a customer's operational needs? 
Yeah, sure. So um, the first thing is that um, you don't have to have the warning zone. You can just have danger zones if you like. Okay. But we like to give you these options because I tend to think of the warning zone as the pre-alert. So in other words, for, um, for the machine operator, just to let them know that um, people or, or other vehicles have come into the vicinity doesn't necessarily mean they're a danger but they need to be pre-warned so that if it does go to a danger, they, they, they're, they've already been made aware and so the decision making is easier on what to do next. From the people's perspective, um, the alert that they get through their tag, for example, just warns them they're getting a bit close, they should maybe walk away, move away a little bit before they, it becomes a critical situation. So that's the concept of the warning zone. Um, the danger zone, really means just that you are now into this zone where potentially you could be hurt and um, and so within this zone for example we could also trigger trigger automated responses from the machine if, if customers want to so as i said essentially um, this is around uh, pre-warning people or actually telling people um, that they're in a danger position when it comes to the safe zone that's a really interesting concept because um, the operator is just as much part of this protection concept as the people around the machine are. So the safe zone is actually around uh, the cab, if you want, for a better description. Um, and so when the operator is within that zone, they're excluded, if you like, from the safety uh, side of things. So they don't keep triggering the system. But if they get out of the cab for any reason, they come out of the safe zone into the danger or warning zone, um, and therefore they're protected in the same way. Or alternatively, uh, as somebody else may want to come into the cab to supervise operations, they can walk through those zones and then into the cab. Um, so those are the sort of concept of the zones. Um, and, um, you know, within those zones, then we can take different actions based on um, but based on just how the customer would like people to react to that. And can they be tailored to distances, so different distances depending on the vehicle or the, the site that someone's using it on? Yes, so there is a, um, it's easily configurable through um, a simple user interface mm -hmm. um, and it's configured in terms of distances, not in some strange magnetics um, uh, sort of formula so people um, or uh, it's password protected so a supervisory person can set the configuration of the machine zones um, and then they're kind of locked away until an authorized person is there so it's simply going into a UI setting the distances that you want locking them in um, and it's as easy as that that's great and you mentioned earlier that the personnel or vehicle operators receive an alert. Um, what type of alerts do they receive and is there a level of automation that can connect this to the vehicle horn or you know, an alarm for, for instance? Yes, they can. So if we look at the person the, at the first instance, as I mentioned, the, uh, the tag that they wear um, has got three ways of communicating with them. So um, there's a a loud beep, there's a, a bright flashing LED and there's vibration um, and that will cope with most of those environmental situations or clothing or where they wear the tag um, and they can mute that as well um, if they choose to do so in terms of the, the beeping and the vibration but the, the flashing doesn't go away so there's a constant reminder. Um, so that's really for the, for the person and the frequency of those will change whether they're in a warning zone or a danger zone. Mm -hmm. When we look at the operator, we put a lot of thought into what did we want the operator to really know about with this display. What we wanted to avoid was a thinking time for them. In other words, a, a huge amount of information coming in that they would have to decipher and decode what was going on. So the display is a custom display absolutely optimized to this. And so essentially they, they get um, a, a yellow ring will appear if somebody comes into the warning zone and then a flashing red ring when it comes into a danger zone. And so it really is a case of even a peripheral vision will pick up the fact that there is something potentially dangerous going on. Um, so that's the sort of the people aspect and the operator aspect. 
The controller has some digital inputs and outputs, and so if the user um, wants to do so, they could use those digital outputs to say interface with a vehicle beacon or a vehicle horn um, yeah. to give further warning to the people around the machine that um, they've triggered an alarm. So there is definitely that option. Oh, that's really interesting. And I understand there's also an add-on automation feature um, to ensure um, equipment stops if someone hypothetically um, ignores the warning zone and decides, I'm uh, sorry, warning sign and decides to breach the, the danger zone. Um, can you take us through this? And is this difficult to set up? No, not really. It isn't. Um, so essentially, it's linked to the setting of the zones, which, as I said, is, is a simple user interface uh, designed specifically for this system. So it's very easy to use. Um, so that's the first thing. We've got two options in terms of interfacing um, and customers do uh, interface with machine for intervention. Typically, this could be, say, um, hydraulic lockout. So in other words, it simply locks the hydraulic pump and stops any of those hydraulic parts moving around. Um, or it could interface with a brake system, for example. Mm -hmm. So there's two ways of doing that. One is through the digital um, I.O. system on the system controller. Um, so literally uh, they can be wired into the controller. Um, but the other option we have um, is using the vehicle CAN bus. Um, so we have a CAN bus capability on that vehicle controller. And that means we can we can pass information directly into the vehicle's control system and then the the control system that can take, then take action from that point onwards. And companies are very focused on capturing data at the moment and using this to improve efficiencies on site. Can the system or tracking tags um, provide helpful data for the management team, um, for example, observing staff movements um, or behaviour on site? Yes, for sure. So I guess um, specifically in terms of the, of the proximity, um, detection, then uh, proximity event logs can be downloaded um, so that um, supervisors can uh, can see if there were any proximity events um, during the shift. Yeah. So that's the first thing, of course, and that's a, an easy sort of KPI, if you like, in terms of um, how the system was triggered and it could perhaps drive changes in the way that the zones are set up potentially. Yeah. Um, in, a, in a sort of a broader term, um, the uh, people can be sort of tracked through the mine. So if they're wearing, for example, the uh, cap lamp version with um, the proximity tag built in, um, or if they're wearing the sort of standard Wi-Fi tracking tag, then as they move away from the vehicles um, into the more gen general areas of the mine, they can be tracked. And that information um, is stored in the MST Helix software um, in terms of historical event logs or in real time. So people can actually determine where people or equipment um, is at any one time, but also where they've been um, over a period of time as well. So that allows both sort of forensic analysis of past events um, as well as real time um, uh, detection of, of where people or equipment is. That's so helpful. And lastly, how does MST's proximity detection system differ from competitors? Um, what's the sort of key point of difference here? Well, I suppose the thing is we, we started off with a specific, um, a specific aim, um, and that was to provide a solution for the proximity detection of people and equipment around moving vehicles. And those vehicles can be several different types. You know, it could be a loader, it could be a drill. You know, they're very different, different types of machines. Um, so we started off with a clean sheet of paper, um, which helps. But I suppose in terms of the major points, it's a completely standalone system. There's no requirement for infrastructure around to make it work. And that's important because quite often in the development areas of the mine, um, it's not uh, cost effective to put in coverage, you know, Wi-Fi coverage, for example. So it's completely standalone. Um, I think the second thing is that the detection um, fields are easily configured. Um, because the, the shapes of danger around machines change. So what's considered a dangerous zone for an LHD would be a different kind of zone maybe for a drill. So it's very easy to configure them. Um, I think the other thing is that it works on both surface and underground. So as these vehicles uh, transition from the underground into the above ground, the system still works. Um, and I think the other thing is that um, the choice of technology with magnetics um, 
magnetic the magnetic detection is not impacted by dust it's not impacted by darkness uh, water humidity um, changes in temperature um, so uh, it's very robust um, for the underground environment as well as the above ground environment um, and of course unlike other technologies it doesn't require a line of sight so these low frequency fields travel well um, and so they're capable of going around corners so it, it's a it's an optimized solution but it does really take into account all of our learnings from our general work in the underground and surface mining that's so interesting um, was there anything else you'd like to add mark or you think that people would find helpful i suppose yeah there's a couple of things really I, the, the system can be retrofitted um so it, it doesn't have to be if you've got an existing fleet um then each vehicle can be retrofitted uh, with this equipment um, it's not restricted to a particular oem so um, it's easy to install to different pieces of equipment mm -hmm. um, although it's used by oems uh, who do use it as a standard part of their equipment so i think those are the key things to remember even if you do have an existing fleet um, it doesn't mean that you can't fit these kind of uh, systems to them um, so there's always an opportunity there to improve the safety um, of your equipment and your people. So um, I think those are the key points. And really, if you need any more information, then please visit our website or go to our YouTube channel where we've got some videos um, of this stuff in action um, or ask us more information. Mm. Well, thank you so much for speaking with us, Mark. This has been really comprehensive and I'm sure anyone that's viewing this right now has um, a really in-depth understanding of proximity detection. So thank you so much for your time. You're welcome. Thanks, Elizabeth.